My book is called Unlikely Partners, and it focuses, as uh, Evan said, on an era from the very recent past. I'm a historian, but I study contemporary history. And it begins in 1976, when Mao Zedong died, and goes through 1993, when China enshrined uh, the mixed system of the socialist market economy, which still is the official designation of the Chinese economy, uh, into the Chinese constitution. And at the center of this era and of the stories that I'll tell you today uh, is Deng Xiaoping, the universally known and often beloved uh, figure who led China during much of this time. And it's a fascinating moment in history. It set the stage for China's rise. When my story begins, China's economy was ruined and relatively isolated following the decade-long Cultural Revolution. Per capita GDP in 1978 was only about 178 US dollars. Deng became paramount leader that year. And as many of you will know, one of his core claims was that socialism did not need to mean poverty. But it wasn't yet clear how to reform China's economy, whether, for instance, the reforms would be similar to policies that Eastern European countries or other socialist countries had pursued, uh, or even what the broadest goals should be. And what I want to tell you today is one element of this story from this period of change which is about how Chinese leaders and intellectuals took what was at the time a very daring step and looked outside of China's borders for new ideas and economic guidance. And not just to Eastern Europe, but also to Western Europe, Asia, North America, uh, Latin America even, and beyond. Uh, Chinese economists partnered with Eastern Bloc critics of socialism, World Bank officials, Nobel laureates, a whole array of individuals. And their success, I argue, helped put China on the path to domestic prosperity and ultimately the global economic power that we uh, know today. I want to emphasize right up front that the foreigners, the, the figures who I'll describe uh, being involved in China's reforms today, they weren't one directionally seeking to change China, but rather to help China change itself. And I use this phrase to change China because, as many of you will know, there's an older model of missionaries and advisors seeking to do just that, described by Jonathan Spence in his really fascinating book of that name. Instead, the point that I want to emphasize today is that during the era of reform and opening, China's rulers were in charge of this process. They were trying to figure out how to reform Chinese socialism and what China's future should look like. This was not a case of imposing some sort of narrowly conceived Washington consensus uh, or airlifting in an externally designed policy package. Chinese leaders sought out foreign ideas and didn't copy them indiscriminately. But my core argument is in some ways a simple one. It, more than many people realize and more than is often described in conventional accounts of this period, China's rulers were open to new ideas, both from abroad and from within. And China's transformation benefited greatly from this engagement. So I will use our time here today to show you what this looked like in practice. And then I'm looking forward to a real dialogue with, uh, with all of you. Um, but since I know that most of you uh, are probably not historians, uh, with a few exceptions, but uh, spend your time thinking about the present, uh, I want to make a case right up front, building on some of what Evan said, for why this history matters today. So in China today, it is very clear that the leadership is weighing the impulse to insulate itself from foreign influence in new ways. They've given intensified emphasis to ideas like self-reliance, while at the same time talking about the threat of so-called Western infiltration and hostile foreign forces. Uh, December 2018 was celebrated as the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening. But many observers have described both parts or one part of that agenda of reform and opening as stalled and perhaps even regressing. We see phrases like reform without opening, uh, we, the end of economic reform, the end of an era, and so on. 
the key line from Xi Jinping's speech on the anniversary encapsulated some of this, and I just want to read it to you. He said, what we should and can reform, we will resolutely reform. What should not be reformed or cannot be reformed, we will resolutely refrain from changing. So this sounds a bit like a riddle, but the core idea is that reform and opening is an agenda that should be understood as partial and limited, and not one that should be understood as comprehensive uh, and sort of aimed at, at everything. Uh, but it's also important to say, in the United States, under President Trump, a turn inward is underway as well. And our relationship with China is certainly undergoing a dramatic reassessment in some quarters. Many people are questioning the value of engagement. And some are even talking about decoupling uh, of our economies and a new Cold War comprehensively. I will focus today on China and China's contemporary history. But I think it's important to acknowledge this fact because partnership takes both sides. And uh, I think in the current environment, both sides are moving away from some of the dynamics that I'll describe. And in the face of some of those geopolitical dynamics, as well as economic challenges at home, the Chinese leadership, to me, seems to be doubling down on the view that economic policy should, in many cases, be subordinate to political concerns. This means that thinkers and policymakers face intensifying limitations on the open search for new ideas, and in particular, on open debate about what ideas are best. And I hope to suggest to you all today that my research uh, might, might bring forward the idea that the costs of these policies may be more severe than we appreciate in real time. Today, as is well documented, the Chinese economy's growth is slowing. Trade tensions certainly are high. Debt burdens have spread across the economy. And investor confidence around the world is uncertain even if China seeks to become more self-reliant technologically, its economic and intellectual ties to the outside world have been a source of strength, not weakness. What Deng Xiaoping and his lieutenants knew is that China succeeds not by limiting its connections to the outside world, but by opening itself up to new ideas wherever they may originate. So, that is my, what we call, presentist argument for why this matters for the present. But now, if you will, let's step back 40 years to a time when China was not yet the global economic superpower it is today. Uh, here you have an image of Deng Xiaoping and another senior leader, Chen Yun, uh, at the Third Plenum uh, in December 1978. This is the event that was celebrated as the start of reform and opening with its 40th anniversary uh, placed this past December. So as I said a moment ago, Deng and his colleagues had set out to make China rich and powerful under this agenda of reform and opening. But by the mid-80s, they'd run into trouble. State-owned enterprises, which produced the majority of China's industrial output, were resisting market-oriented change. Growth was soaring uncontrollably, wildly surpassing expectations, but inflation was rising rapidly along with it. And reformers and conservatives within the party competed to provide solutions. So you've all heard of Deng Xiaoping, but today I want to focus on some of the officials who actually managed the economic reforms on a day-to-day -day basis. Deng would often set a broad direction or a broad objective with a often pithy phrase, and then other senior officials would be charged with figuring out what that was actually going to mean in policy terms. So, some of the crucial figures here you might have heard of, people like at the very senior level, General Secretary Hu Yaobang and Premier Zhao Ziyang, people like Vice Premier Gu Mu, uh, and then other economists that I'll describe today. I'm going to focus particularly uh, on Zhao Ziyang because he's a fascinating figure who, uh, for reasons I'll describe, uh, doesn't get nearly the attention that uh, he, he uh, would if things had turned out a little differently. So when I first started studying this period, what jumped out to me most was just how open-ended the direction of China's reforms seemed. Uh, Zhao wrote in his posthumously published memoirs a line that I'll read to you. He wrote, my earliest understanding of how to proceed with reform was shallow and vague. I did not have any preconceived model or a systematic idea in mind. 
It's a stunning acknowledgement from the person who was in charge of economic policy for pretty much the entirety of the 1980s. And it really underscores the open-endedness of the transformations that were uh, underway in this period. So what to do? To meet this challenge, the leadership built up a network of economic experts who provided policy ideas. Because they felt that China had been isolated and had fallen behind, Deng, Zhao, and others were open-minded, as I've said, and eager to learn from abroad. And this set the tone throughout the bureaucracy for the other officials who were working on economic policy. Others, of course, uh, often embodied in the person of Chen Yun, pushed back and tried to maintain the supremacy of the state, the party, and even Maoist and Marxist ideas. So one part of this, one part of this process involved restoring the status attached to the discipline of economics. Now, here at Chicago, that's never been a problem. But in the Cultural Revolution, neoclassical economics and even Marxian political economy was attacked as a counter-revolutionary black wind. It took time to bring back the economists and begin training or retraining them. Now, the questions that they debated will be familiar to many of you who've either studied China or studied other socialist countries. Should price liberalization occur rapidly or gradually? How should enterprises be reformed? How could international trade and foreign investment be encouraged while also being controlled? And most fundamentally, could the socialist nature of China's system be maintained even with the introduction of market mechanisms? The answers to these questions were not decided in advance. There was no grand plan or blueprint. No single outcome was inevitable. Instead, there was fierce debate, immense contestation, and constant ups and downs, a phrase that was often used by members of the leadership crossing the river by feeling for the stones. And what unified this period was an attitude, an approach to problems as they emerged in the economy. Open-mindedness, attaching value to economic expertise, and a hunger to learn balanced with a deep confidence in the uniqueness of China's experience and in the ability, indeed, of the Chinese Communist Party uh, to lead the reforms. These qualities coexisted, even as they were sometimes in tension. And they enabled gradual changes to the structure of the Chinese economy. So I know that talking about openness and these other dynamics can be quite abstract. So I'm going to dive into a specific story, which is at the heart of my book. Uh, before I do, I just want to show you this image, which I love for several reasons. First, it is, for those of you who are Chinese politics nerds, it's a wonderful example of democratic centralism in action. Uh, decisions are debated under this pr Leninist principle, and then everyone agrees to them. So there is seeming unanimity in this photo. But uh, the figures depicted disagreed about many of the most essential questions of the sort that I just summarized for you. You can also see here uh, at least two generations represented. Uh, on the one hand, you have the revolutionary elders, figures like Deng, Li Xianyan, Qian Yun, etc. Uh, on the other hand, you have the younger generation, or relatively younger in their 60s, uh, who are represented here by Hu Yaobang and Zhao. Uh, just as one final note, uh, you even have, still as of 1981, uh, Mao Zedong's designated successor, Hua Guofeng, Still in the second row of the rostrum, barely making the frame, but uh, he, is, he is still there and he is still raising his hand, though uh, would not be the case for much longer. Uh, so you can see here many of the dynamics of this period uh, en encapsulated, at least in implication. So the story that I want to tell you today is, uh, was, the, was the kind of story that really got me excited about this project when I started. It's the story of a river cruise that took place in 1985. It brought together many of China's top economic policymakers with an amazing cast of economists from abroad. And because I'm a historian, I'll just say quickly that the sources for this draw from archival research, uh, the personal papers of many of the economists, as well as Chinese government sources, interviews with living participants in both China and outside of China, as well as a variety of other materials. And I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A uh, about my sources and research, if any of you would like. So 
Uh, this conference was convened on direct orders from the central leadership. The World Bank worked with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and the System Reform Commission to organize this cruise. The bank's chief of mission in China at this period, an extraordinarily uh, cosmopolitan individual named Edwin Lim, invited a diverse group of economists from abroad. So first, I just want to show you uh, the generational point that I mentioned a moment ago is certainly true also of the economists who were represented from the Chinese side. Here you have four individuals, two of whom were part of the generation that built the planned economy in China, developed the first five-year plan, Xue Muqiao and Ma Hong. And then on the right hand, you have two other individuals, one of whom, for those of you who uh, have lived in China or studied Chinese economics, will be very familiar to you. Uh, but these two individuals, Li Kemu and the still very influential Wu Jinglian, uh, were the younger generation. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But uh, I always like to show this image not only because it's kind of an extraordinary snapshot uh, of, of this moment in the mid 80s, but because it really underscores that on the one hand, you have people who cut their teeth building a socialist planned economy. On the other hand, you have people who were just coming into the first flush of their careers in this period, trying to figure out the way forward. So there were two names on the Western side that I want you to remember. One is the American Yale economist, uh, James Tobin, a neo-Keynesian who had won the Nobel Prize a few years before. The other is Janos Kornai, who was a Hungarian critic of socialism, uh, then just beginning to teach at Harvard. Others came from Great Britain, France, West Germany, Poland, and Yugoslavia. But to return to the Chinese side, figures of the, like the octogenarian Xue Muqiao and caste president Ma Hong, I think that the most interesting thing to think about in relation to their position in this period was they had, as I said, cut their teeth building this planned economy. And they were now tasked with precisely the task of undoing elements of that system that they had helped to build. And Zhu Wen, who's not pictured here but was in charge of the System Reform Commission, wrote uh, in this period in his diary that uh, he had had two tasks in his life. First, to make planning and socialism work in China. And then second, to rebuild it anew from the, from the ground up. And these figures often gave immense prestige to the discipline of economics. They were well known throughout the country. They were close with senior leaders. But often, many of the best ideas came from figures in their mid-career, uh, like Wu Jinglian or Zhao Renwei and Liu Guoguang. These figures had mostly been uh, at a point in their careers where they were just beginning before the Cultural Revolution, and then spent a decade uh, working as a laborer, sent down, sent down youth or, or other, uh, other sort of agricultural and industrial jobs. When they returned to work after Mao's death, they were just stunned at the situation of the Chinese economy, how, uh, the, the, how large the scale of the problems were, and they were filled with curiosity about the outside world. So Wu Jinglian, for instance, immediately started to learn English because he decided that actually to read much of the most current economic thinking, he would have to learn this skill that was not in and of itself necessary to be a successful economist in China. But he was filled with this kind of curiosity about the outside world. And I'll just say, in addition, there were a few figures of a younger generation. Uh, you know, sort of fresh out of graduate school, or in some cases even still in grad school, who were the most junior participants on the Chinese side. And two of them uh, are names that may be familiar to some of you, uh, Lo Jiwei and Guo Shuqing. So Lo and Guo actually shared a room on board the uh, SS Bashan cruise ship, a bunk bed. Um, Lo recently completed his term as China's Minister of Finance and remains an influential voice. Uh, Guo Shuqing is, was uh, about a year ago promoted to be party secretary of the People's Bank of China, uh, the central bank, while also leading an important regulatory body. So the lineages from this period, the ideas that were discussed, uh, remain influential not only as ideas, but in some of the individuals who uh, had some of their first introductions to international economic thinking through these channels. So, the Chinese participants 
the number of them, the seniority, reflected how seriously the Chinese side and the Chinese government took these exchanges. The reason, for instance, that a cruise ship was chosen for the location was not simply because it would provide a nice backdrop to photographs like this, but because the Chinese leadership wanted to isolate the officials and economists from their daily work so that they would actually focus on learning. Uh, as those of you who've been in government jobs will know, it's you know the idea of not having anything coming into your inbox for a week is unthinkable while you're serving as an official. Uh, the goal was exactly that, to isolate them so that they could really listen and learn. Premier Zhao met with the visitors in Beijing before they went south for the cruise, and he asked for their advice on how to handle the urban and industrial reforms. And he even acknowledged that there were really serious risks in the overheated economy. This tone of extraordinary openness was not lost on the participants. They were surprised to hear a senior Chinese government official so frankly acknowledging the scale of the problems and the need for new ideas, the sense that chi the Chinese leadership didn't know what to do to solve these problems. And that tone continued on the cruise itself. So I want to focus particularly on the two presentations of the individuals I mentioned to you, uh, Tobin and Kornai. So here is Tobin with Xue Muqiao on, on deck. So Tobin was a Nobel laureate, famous economist around the world. He'd advised President Kennedy. But at this conference, he gave a presentation that was basically macroeconomics 101. It's important to remember that few of the Chinese economists had ever studied what we think of as neoclassical economics or modern economics. They'd been trained in Marxian political economy. So Tobin delivered a crash course on monetary policy, outlining how governments manage aggregate demand, uh, descri describing the institutions that would allow for stable fiscal and monetary policy. And of course, in the room were many of the officials who were themselves tasked with doing just that, designing China's macroeconomic policymaking institutions. Uh, I mean, it's a really amazing thing to go back and look at his notes from this conference and see you know, supply and demand. He's really going through it step by step. He's predicting what an inflation rate will be given, given different uh, money supply. And that's sort of, I mean, it's a really amazing thing. But he got their attention uh, because of his seniority. Now, Kornai's presentation was something different. Kornai had become famous as a critic of socialist economics by beginning with the really simple facts of daily life in socialist countries around the world. Empty grocery store shelves, just a few styles of clothing, and lengthy queues at every store. He argued that chronic shortages were the inevitable result of traditional uh, economic planning under socialism. This wasn't just an error in one country's execution of the ideas. It was intrinsic to the, the ideas into the system. Now, for China, at this presentation seen here, Kornai advocated pursuing a policy of market coordination with macroeconomic control from the state. Kornai argued that China should focus on its enterprises, focus on reforms to its enterprises. The goal, of course, should be to make them respond to market forces rather than only seeking to please bureaucratic superiors, rather than only looking at what the cadre above wanted them to do. This meant implementing uh, reforms so that quotas and bad investments were not uh, in the category where a superior who liked the head of a given SOE could forgive it, uh, but instead uh, to use competition to force enterprises to harden their budget constraints and improve their performance. But he granted the state could still manage macroeconomic policy and even regulate the economic and legal parameters of the market and, most intriguingly, even some administrative interventions could continue for the foreseeable future. Now, Kornai's words resonated in a way that surprised me when I first began to read and talk to people who had attended this conference. Uh, Wu Jinglian, for instance, later wrote that he had concluded then, at this moment, that a market with macroeconomic management should be the primary objective of China's economic reforms. Now, I also want to note, for those of you who, are, who you know, study socialist transition or think about these questions, Kornai's advice that he gave in China differed from the views for which he was widely known around the world. 
He had offered scathing criticisms of so-called halfway house reforms to socialism in Eastern Europe. But that's simply not what he argued when he was in China. And so when I interviewed him in Budapest a few years ago, I, I asked him why. He said that he realized that the Chinese economists did not see his idea of shortage as a condemnation of all variants of socialism, but, quote, restricted it as a criticism of the command economy. He said, it's a strong perception on my side that China is China and Budapest is Budapest. I had, in that sense, two different faces, one face for Hungary and the other face for China. I'd also emphasize that it was very clear to the foreign attendees that the Chinese side was in charge. At the end of the conference, another uh, one of the visiting economists, uh, Scottish economist Sir Alec Cairncross, wrote in his diary, quote, I have no doubt that the Chinese officials consider what to do very carefully before deciding and do not necessarily accept advice. The foreign experts knew that they had met at the Chinese leadership's request and on the Chinese leadership's terms. So where did this go from here? Well, a small group of the Chinese participants huddled together after the conference concluded and quickly sent an internal report up to top party leaders. And those leaders liked what they saw. Later that month in internal party meetings, we can see that top party, top party leaders discussed the experts' suggestions that China focus on its inefficient enterprises in new ways, seeking to harden their budget constraints. They even used Cornice phrases, investment hunger and soft budget constraint, to characterize newly the major problems of state-owned enterprises. Now, I should step back here and say, I intend the story of the Bashan Conference, as interesting and textured as it is, to just be an illustration. It is illustrative. It's just one of a whole range of ways in which Chinese and foreign economists were involved in China's reform process. And it's just one of many international exchanges that occurred in this period. Uh, in my research, I've discovered policy-focused exchanges with figures from all around the world, both sides of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and even, I will say, because uh, I am here at UChicago with a man who probably once walked these very halls, uh, Milton Friedman. So I'll talk a little bit about Milton Friedman in China. Before I do, uh, this is another photo from the cruise. Um, I like it because you know they're all kind of excitedly pointing in the same direction, you know, as if embodying the spirit. Except actually, they're probably pointing at some monkeys or you know some nice scenery. Um, but uh, just another photo to show. But um, here we have a Milton Friedman meeting with Zhao Ziyang in 1988. So Friedman was first invited to China in 1980, extraordinarily early. Uh, basically, the, you know, the December 1978 third plenum you know, had occurred just over a year before. And Milton Friedman was famous around the world as a free market fundamentalist and a severe critic of the kind of system that was in place in China and that was being discussed in China. He had gone on TV just six months before he went to China explicitly saying that greed is the engine of societies and it's even the engine of so-called socialist societies. And of course, Marx is wrong about everything. And anyone who thinks otherwise is, is foolish. Um, so why did the Chinese invite him in 1980? Why was he hosted by the Chinese government that year? Well, it turns out that uh, as the Chinese economists and officials were learning about ideas around the world, they had one really big worry, which was inflation. Inflation had been repressed in China during the period of state set prices. So even if there were inflationary pressures in the economy, they wouldn't manifest themselves in prices rising. They would sort of manifest in shortages of the, short, of the sort that Korn I described. But in reading about the world, one senior banking official found uh, the following uh, generalization to be uh, what he had learned from, from his initial reading about the outside world. He said, um, Keynesians like inflation, and Friedman is opposed to inflation. So it doesn't sound so bad. If you're opposed to inflation, you might as well invite Milton Friedman. Hear what he has to say. Uh, 
they were not prepared for the uh, ideological component of Friedman's worldview. They were not prepared for the absolute commitment to what Friedman called free private markets. So the initial visit in 1980 was a bit of a disaster. Uh, Friedman sort of did not, you know, he did not have two faces. He did not change his spiel for this context. And the Chinese side was really quite upset. I mean, I'm genuinely, authentically offended by some of the assertions that were being made. And so at one point, they uh, took Friedman up to a, a hotel room uh, in the building where they were all staying. And um, they gave him a long lecture on the triumphs of the Chinese revolution and Marxist, uh, you know, basically Marxian political economy and the history of Marxism. Uh, and Friedman left very, very upset also, saying, you know, these people are wrong about so much. And, uh, and yet, eight years later, he was invited back. Uh, he was invited back to a very different China, a China that had changed quite a lot over the period of just eight years. But he was also invited back to a China that was much more uh, sophisticated and much more able to figure out what Milton Friedman might and might not be useful for to them. So in 1988, China was facing a really serious inflationary crisis that was primarily a crisis of public confidence. Uh, there had been an abortive attempt at price reform. Uh, there had been all sorts of panic buying. The leadership was really trying to uh, instill some confidence in people. And in particular, Zhao Ziyang, at that point, who was general secretary, was trying to instill confidence in his leadership of the economy. So Friedman's visit was essentially a propaganda opportunity. Uh, they had this meeting. It was widely publicized. Uh, and there wasn't much influence, but there was a great deal of attention to how Zhao was praised by Milton Friedman. Uh, and then Friedman would return for third and final time in 1993. So to just briefly summarize the remainder of this story, uh, in 1987 at the historic 13th Party Congress, a system in which the state manages the market and the market guides the enterprises was endorsed. An ambitious set of new policies were introduced that fostered private enterprise, using the coastal regions to propel growth and developing new institutions. After the tragedy of June 4th in 1989, many of these dynamics were frozen. Zhao Ziyang was purged and erased from history. And as a result, many of the stories that I've told you today about the 1980s were also erased or marginalized. In the 1990s, the reforms eventually resumed. Uh, the economy soared, and the system that China built, a socialist market economy, remained the guide of the Chinese economic model. And this cemented the enduring mix of state and market that had been developed in the 1980s. Under Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji in the 1990s, China oversaw the rapid growth of the private sector while maintaining state-owned enterprises on the commanding heights of the economy. Zhu Rongji, who continued to consult foreign economists, met, uh, pushed forward reforms to state-owned enterprises, fiscal reforms. And in 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization, as we've been hearing a lot about lately. This rapid growth was not without significant con negative consequences. But by 2010, China had overtaken Japan as the world's second largest economy by gross domestic product. So why is it important? to bring the fuller stories of these collaborative partnerships into the history of China's economic transformation, which it can often feel like we know so well. Well, there are at least two reasons I want to discuss. First, as scholars, this is crucial for developing a richer historical understanding of China after Mao. Second, with an eye to the present and to some of the dynamics that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, if we leave these stories out, we'll overlook the tremendous value that China has derived on its own terms from wide-ranging and open-minded exchanges with the world. That means that China risks missing out on the confidence-building effects of sustained interactions about new ideas to solve China's problems. And it may mean the intensification of this chilling effect at home uh, on both economic thinking and policymaking at a moment when it's urgently needed to confront major challenges. Of course, in some sense, I imagine I'm preaching to the choir here. The Paulson Institute and all of you who are gathered here today embody the immense value of this kind of broad collaborative partnership. So I'll add one final moment, and then I hope you all have lots of questions. <laughs> 
I, I was just in, in Beijing, and it was particularly interesting as a historian to watch the rollout of this 40th anniversary of reform and opening. Uh, Xi Jinping gave a big speech, and I recently visited the, the National Museum where there's a new exhibition called The Great Transformation about this 40-year history. Um, but actually, I noticed that, in fact, the exhibition is almost all about China today and in the future. There's really very little history at all. And the history of the 1970s and 80s is given remarkably little attention. Perhaps because stories like the sort that I've described, which are a core part of that history, uh, don't seem to fit the current political dynamics on either side of the Pacific. But that makes it all the more important, I think, that we learn about these stories and reflect on their implications. For people of my generation, it's important that we learn these stories and ourselves engage in exchanges across the Pacific. Our elders will leave behind a US-China relationship that we have to live with. And it's certainly not too early to begin thinking of ways to raise up our voices a bit more and get involved. And that can include uh, telling the positive stories of openness's rewards, even as we tell the much darker stories that frame so much of what we see happening in China today, from Xi Jinping's intensifying authoritarianism to the situation in Xinjiang. People to people and expert exchanges from universities, the professions, and beyond can make a real difference. This is not simply window dressing or soft stuff. This can really matter. And because of your unique perspective here, you are all exceptionally well positioned to contribute to this. And I hope that this history suggests just how important a task that is. So with that, I look forward to all of your questions. So thank you for the very interesting stories. Uh, so I think the idea that uh, foreign economies contribute to economic transitions is not new, right, if you look at Eastern Europe. Uh, but the outcome is not always good. Right. So what do you think that prevented the Chinese side from taking advice that uh, in a Chinese context, may may not yeah. be working. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We can take one or two other questions to start, if there are. Okay, sure. Yeah. So you mentioned for uh, Milton Friedman's second visit that China was more sophisticated at being able to you know take what they need and leave behind the rest. And I think that's a common pattern. You know, being able to sort of selectively take from like the Western toolbox without you know, keeping the associated ideology that goes with it. Right. And like, what happened between 80 and 88 to like develop that sophistication? Okay. Thanks. Great. OK, I'll answer those two, and then we can go over here. Um, in fact, because I actually think they're related. So uh, to your question about preventing them from taking bad advice or, or the c contrast, which I think is really fascinating with Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. A few things, uh, but the most important was the point that I tried to stress at the beginning, which was the Chinese side uh, insisted on maintaining its control over this process. The agency rested firmly with the Chinese side. That's not just an interpretive decision that I make as a writer thinking about this book or as a historian trying to recreate something that happened in the past. The emphasis on we, the Chinese side, are listening to you so that we can figure out what you have to say that is useful to us. That is one of the dominant dynamics of this form of interaction, uh, I think, is the single biggest difference. Because in many of those other cases, the goal was to import a full policy plan designed externally, often with very little attention to the specifics of a national situation, of national, social, and political and economic dynamics. So. Uh, I think one of the challenging things for us outside of China to think about in relation to that question is that often the role of foreign expertise is as an input in a policy process that we, as outsiders, don't control. And the temptation to think that if we control the policy process, the outcomes will be better is strong. But I think that there's a lot of contravening evidence uh, that at least call for humility in, in thinking about that. As far as what had changed between 1988 and 1980, I mean, the 1980s are an extraordinarily interesting decade because of the speed with which uh, this form of intellectual catching up and mastery occurred. By 1988, China, Chinese economists were deeply familiar with a whole range 
of international economic ideas. They had had eight more years of experimentation. In 1980, the urban and industrial reforms had not even really started. At that point, reform was primarily occurring in the countryside, and there was conversation about how to bring it into the industrial sectors of the economy and how to bring it into the cities. But it was really only after 1984 that that began to happen slowly. Um, the other biggest difference was that the intellectual environment had changed, uh, had become much more, much more liberal. Uh, in 1980, the uh, economic agenda was one of, of retrenchment, actually. It was sort of, we've, we've done some changes, but we need to make sure we still control uh, the way in which the economy is moving. And intellectuals were just beginning to have their status restored after the Cultural Revolution with you know, going back and looking at old verdicts and saying that was an unfair denunciation. By 1988, they were much more empowered. Um, so those are just some of the differences. Could you provide some clarification as to the role of the Western economists, such as Tobin, that you mentioned, um, in terms of um, their role as economic instructors and as uh, signaling devices for the Chinese regime in, in signaling to the outside world that they're opening up to, to the market system? Right. This is, is a very perceptive point. Um, I think many of the interactions served that function, as frankly they still do today. Meeting with a senior foreigner or a senior business executive is often a mechanism exactly for signaling to the outside world. One of the reasons that the 1985 Bashan Conference is uh, of interest to me is that it was really not covered very much outside of China. Uh, so its function as a international signaling or international propaganda device was limited. Its function as a signaling mechanism within China, I think, was very significant. Um, demonstrating what it meant to have economists debating issues. The economists did not all agree. I mean, many of them had you know, different views about the way in which, sorry, the way in which China should develop. Um, showing how economists thought about problems, debated with one another, but could still provide useful inputs to policy, that I think was very much something that they were uh, hoping would be advertised uh, across the country. Um, so yeah, I became very interested in all of the different dynamics that could fit under this category of partnerships. You know, there's not only uh, the pedagogical relationship or not only the propaganda relationship, but a whole range of other more temporary or longer term uh, forms of, of interaction and even influence. Um, I was wondering whether, uh, you know, over the 80s and 90s, who you would have thought were the most influential Western economists or foreign economists in China, um, whether because you can see their fingerprints on certain parts of policy or whether just because there were groups of economists within China who kind of hewed to, to sort of their school of thought um, and whether there was kind of a disconnect between how influential those foreign economists were in China to the actual versus their actual influence overseas. Yeah. Do you want to get another? Yeah, I'll take a few more. Yeah. Hi. So, um, your, your father has been kind of one of the leading um, thinkers in terms of spurring legal reform in China for many years, um, which I, th I think we, we can fairly say has been sobering. And so when you contrast kind of reform efforts in the economic realm mm -hmm. versus the legal realm, are you able to kind of come up with any comparative insights? Mm. Thanks. Okay, let's take one more. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, I kind of wanted to ask you to uh, stretch your narrative even farther back in time and think about this um, this issue of uh, reformers in China engaging with uh, foreign experts, so to speak. Uh, think back to the 19th century, a period where uh, the you know phrase ti yong you know, uh, Chinese studies for kind of essence or substance and uh, foreign studies for um, for utility. And I'm wondering if you could talk about um, this 1980s moment in, in those terms. I'm, to hypothesize quickly, it seems like in the current moment there is this reassertion of Chinese essence as kind of the underlying foundation that can't be abrogated. I'm wondering if you think that was true in the 1980s as well. Um, and so kind of use that larger uh, historical context to kind of comment a little bit on how have things changed a lot since the 1980s? And does that Tiyong framework help us understand that at all? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. OK, fantastic questions. Um, so first to the question uh, on who or what was most influential, this is a question that I have always tried to sort of parry because my interest is most in 
not simply a checklist of proposals that were or were not accepted or direct lines of influence that can or cannot be traced, but in thinking about some of these dynamics around receiving foreign advice. But uh, for the purposes of this audience, I will, I will humor it for sure. Um, I think that uh, we can answer this in a few different ways. So a figure like Kornai, obviously I believe was, was highly influential pretty much across the board policy, shaping the way that economists thought about problems, and also shaping the way that the public uh, began to learn about international economics. I think the biggest reason for that, or the reason that earlier the Czech economist Oda Schick uh, was very influential, were that these were figures who could speak in the language of Marxian political economy and in the language of socialist systems to critique it. They were essentially neoclassical econo economists, but they were using these systems as the basis of their analysis. It's very different from uh, someone like James Tobin, who's using a American system or an English system as the basis of his analysis. Uh, on economics education, figures like Gregory Chow, Dwight Perkins, uh, people who had more uh, subject matter expertise in China were often very influential at helping universities begin to develop uh, their sort of basic economics training courses uh, in this in this new era. Uh, so there's a whole variety of those kinds of uh, kinds of influences. Um, on the question of legal reform, it's it's a, I mean, from my perspective, it's a it's a quite uh, different case. Even though there are some similarities worth noting, such as Chinese officials and scholars both reaching out for foreign models or foreign expertise. But the biggest difference, uh, and I think this will connect also to the question about uh, the Tiyong binary and Chinese essence, the biggest difference is that the classic line used by Zhao and other economic reformers was that the economic sphere should be kept separate from the political and ideological spheres. And that was at least an argument that could be made not being superficially on the face of it you know, untenable. I think the big issue that legal reform has encountered, of course, is that the legal system is now, we know, supposed to be subordinate to the party. Uh, and as a result, the idea that legal reform could occur in a way that wouldn't impinge directly on political or social or even ideological control, uh, I think that's a much harder argument to make. Um, but doesn't mean it's any less necessary. And I think that's one of the most challenging things, even from an economics perspective, looking at contemporary China and thinking, how does the lack of meaningful uh, legal enforcement or greater legal transparency or stronger courts or all of these sorts of things, how does the economy continue to develop without those mechanisms for, uh, for creating trust in addition to creating predictability? Um, your question is, is fascinating. And I, I unfortunately, I don't have time to give as historiographically rigorous an answer as I would like. But uh, I'll say, so. In the 1980s, the open-endedness that I have alluded to, I think, to an astonishing degree, extended to questioning even that binary in a way that actually recalls some of the moments of, of 19th century questioning of elements of that binary or early 20th century questioning. Uh, the most famous example of this is the documentary River Elegy, uh, which came out in, in the late 80s and explicitly said that Chinese civilization was in the uh, language of the documentary, the problem, and there needed to be the washing away of this lowest filled Chinese civilization, slow moving with a great flood of foreign ideas. And this obviously is, is too far. And frankly, despite the immense popularity of this, I think most people watched it uh, to be scandalized. You know, meaning that if you read reports from that time, you know, it's clear that people watching it were not all saying, yes, we agree. Uh, but it raised many of the deep questions that uh, came to the fore in 1989, where a really important corollary of the crackdown on the student movement was precisely a stricter bifurcation of forms of economic change, transformation, even liberalization, kept separate from cultural, social, political liberalization. The language of critiquing bourgeois liberalization, we're now getting very wonky, but that language uh, became uh, central to the system. And indeed, that phrase, bourgeois liberalization, uh, being, criti being criticized, is in the Chinese constitution still. So there are ways in which the reassertion of the 
a centralized and normatively positive Chinese civilization uh, really comes back after that. And now, of course, Xi Jinping is a sort of a spokesperson for a certain kind of civilizational rejuvenation uh, that I think is really central to understanding what he's up to. Um, yeah, sorry, we can, we can talk more about that. Do I have time for one, one or two more questions? Just kind of picking up on the previous question, on the subject of uh, Chinese responses to foreign experts, I wonder if you had any observations on how the 80s compared to the 50s, which was probably the last mm -hmm. experience of significant you know, foreign uh, assistance through the, the Soviet advisors involved in you know, the first and the second five-year plans. Cool. Uh, so yes, I'll say very briefly, um, this was, a, I mean, these are very different periods in terms of engaging with international expertise in a few different ways. One was that, I mean, at that point, the Soviet Union was the elder brother uh, and in the early, I mean, in the early 50s in particular, the Chinese economists were very committed to figuring out how to apply Soviet planning strategies and bureaucracies and structures to the Chinese case, though never perfectly, uh, never one for one. One particularly interesting story, though, is that in the 1980s, uh, one of the Soviet economic officials who had been a very close partner with Chen Yun and others during the first, first five-year plan period, uh, Arkhipov, came to China. And he had a meeting with Chen Yun that, uh, that was sort of tearful, my old friend. You know, Chen was very elderly and sickly at that point, but made sure to have a long time with him. And there was a lot of worry that Chen Yun would go off his talking points and be critical of the reforms. And this meeting was great. And uh, then Chen Yun said, you know, um, you know, my dear friend, where are you going next? And he said, I'm going to Shenzhen. I want to see the SCZs. We're actually very interested in the Soviet Union in learning from the SCZs, uh, from the special economic zones. And he said, so and w what do you think of the SCZs, uh, Chen Yun? And Chen said, well, I have never been myself to a special economic zone, but I hope you will enjoy it. And so you have this kind of strange and nuanced inversion of many of the dynamics in the 50s where a senior Soviet economic official comes meets with his old friend, there's a real connection there, a real sense of comradeship. But uh, the new vanguard of socialist reform uh, and socialist economics is in China's south. And Chen Yun himself has never seen this, even though it's within his own country. So OK, with that, thank you all so much. Thank you, Evan. Thank you.